Hi all, good to see you again. Uh, today I've got an instructional video for you. So we're going to talk about pruning in general, uh, especially about pruning of the leguminous plants in my system here. Uh, because as you remember, I've got uh, ice cream beans and other nitrogen fixing plants as alley crops in between my crop rows. And of course, these guys have grown crazy with the recent rains and they need a bit of a haircut. So some of them have become much bigger than I would have wanted them, but uh, there was other priorities, so I couldn't really get to doing the job, but they're still manageable. And now we're gonna look at how we're gonna trim uh, some of the even larger branches. And I've got a few tools for you. I'll show you them over here. So this is the tool selection that we're gonna use today. And so what you're looking at here is a pole saw, uh, a bit of product placement there. Well, I'm quite happy with Husqvarna, but obviously up to everyone what brand they prefer. This one is also extendable. So it's a very, very handy tool. And don't forget your helmet when you operate a pole saw. Then we've also got a pruning saw. That's an arborist saw. Uh, brand Silky, also surely other ones around like ARS is a good brand as well. Uh, they cross cut saws, they cut on pull and uh, they're my preferred saw uh, for this job. And then we've also got a machete, this one is from Laos, cost me about a dollar over there about 15 years ago and it's also one of my favorite ones. I might just show you that this is a machete that actually has a thick blade and I prefer them, they're more like an axe almost and usually they keep this part here very very sharp whereas the, the part on the uh, tip is used for a bit rougher job so it gets blunt a bit quicker and it's made with a bamboo handle if you can see that that's just uh, put in in steel rings here and then my newest tool, that's quite an essential tool, I'd say. And if you are onto your pruning early enough, you can probably get away with only this tool. So this is a, a pole lopper. So it's like the regular shear type loppers with a secateur uh, cutter on a stick. The whole thing is a bit less than two meters long and it gives me quite a lot of reach. So I love to use that for my ice cream beans and I'll show you then later how that works. And here we're back again. So right into it, we've got a few smaller branches here. So if you're pruning bees, of course you don't need much more than a second tier. I didn't show you earlier, my second tier is always on me. I got a nice pouch for it as well and I recommend you guys to spend a bit of money on them because it's the most commonly tool, most commonly used tool in the garden. So you'll have a lot of use of that and these tools have to just be up for the task. So in this case it's an ARS brand. I also prefer carbon steel because they keep the edge better and I do sharpen them quite regularly. Uh, just keep your secateurs nice and sharp and uh, it makes your job really much easier later on. You know, it's also less strain on your wrist. And what's a really good uh, strategy, strategy when you are uh, trimming is to reduce your weight from the top. So before you start making a giant cut somewhere close to the trunk, you want to make sure you cut all the stuff that you can reach either easily with just uh, straighten out your arm with the secateur or this tool is so handy because it's like a secateur on an extension and so you can trim branches that are a bit out of reach uh, really easily. In fact this tool can cut larger diameters than my secateur up to 40 or 45 millimeters so a substantial uh, diameter branch it's quite um, quite incredible okay now let's have a look what we can do with this so we'll start with this tree here 
and you can see that I've got another leguminous tree here that's a Mackay cedar and you see it's totally shaded out by that ice cream bean so we need to make a bit of breathing space for this guy here and we'll start trimming above this tree so because I'm trimming overhead you see I've got my helmet on I'm not even using a chainsaw just yet but just because things can fall on my head fairly quickly I prefer to wear a helmet anyway I'm not going to use the visor because there won't be much sawdust however a helmet is always advisable okay so what have we got here so there's a few branches here that are not actually that thick but just to demonstrate how nice this is I also pull this branch away as I'm trimming so it doesn't fall onto the tree below and here it goes already now with these small ones I'm not going to bother too much uh, to make the cuts properly but once the diameters get a bit bigger we're going to do the cut to what we call a collar cut and I'll show you that later on as well I have a durian planted under there and in the beginning I was really worried that the durian is going to burn in the sun so this little one here was planted in the shade of this big tree and now it turns out that the durians that are planted in a sunnier location have grown much better so now I will open this up for this durian as well to get a bit more sun because it looks like they can deal with way more sun than I expected That's really handy. The hook is on the back side of the blade here. And so you can just uh, grab things that fall out of reach. But I'm still not happy with the height because what I want to do is make sure that in the future when this tree regrows, that all the branches that come off it are in the reach of this tool. That's new, right? I only came across this tool recently and now I have to shape my trees to uh, accommodate this tool for future ease of use. So that saves me pole saws. You can also cut half, like I'm doing here. Now that branch is still attached, see that? And because I'm going to cut this way lower anyway, now I can just pull on it, but you see what happened here? I've torn the bark and that's usually something you want to avoid if this is your final cut. But because this wasn't my final cut, I can do that. And I have a hinge where this branch is still hanging on, especially with the wattles, with the ice cream beans. A lot of legumes have a very uh, stringy bark and they can support quite a bit of weight. I've just noticed on my elderberry that it has come down with pink's disease which is really sad. So you see the dead uh, branches here? When you follow them down to the base, you see that the entire branch here is covered in, in a pink, uh, in a fungus that's all around and it ring barks the plant. So now the only thing that I can do here is to trim away everything that's affected, which is down here. And then disinfect my secateur with bleach so I'm not uh, transmitting that disease to other plants. How is that for a tree? A case of mangium. I planted this tree about three years ago and it's turned into a trunk like over, oh, that's. 12 to 13 centimeters in diameter times two and it's completely grown away from me so I should have trimmed this tree down much earlier and that means that I may lose the tree because I will now inflict quite large wounds to it with my pole saw and once a tree is that size and has diameters that big it really has a hard time to heal over those wounds and then 
of course disease like fungal disease can go in there and uh, eventually uh, kill the tree off. So these guys are quite an interesting plant because they're actually one of those Australian sclerophyll plants. I'll just show you the leaves of this tree. So this is, wattles are, they don't actually have leaves, they have phyllodes. So this, what you see here, is the stem of the leaf. And the leaf was up here in the past, like millions of years ago. And it has been discarded, or the plant has stopped using that. But it has started flattening the stem of the leaf instead. And the only giveaway you still get on those plants is that when they are small babies, they come up with a leaf like this one next to us here. So you see this Albizia, same family. And you see how it has these pinnate leaves. There's also a stick insect here while we're at it. <laughs> and uh, so these pinnate leaves are quite common in that family. You might have also heard about rain tree or leucina, uh, which I'm not gonna plant by the way. So, but these guys here have given up on that. And, and so they've turned into what's really famous in Australia called sclerophyll. This is one of the reasons why I was a bit skeptical about using black wattles, or sorry, uh, acacia mangium, it's not black wattle, uh, but wattles in general for uh, green manure because these leaves here are much tougher than the ones of other legumes. And that means they have a higher carbon to nitrogen ratio. So when you produce mulch of these guys, it may not supply the surrounding plants or your crop uh, with nitrogen as well as other uh, chop and drop green manure plants do. You can still use them as that, and I, I actually do, but um, it's something that has to be seen in the long run whether these guys are just as effective with green manure as their cousins are. So with these guys, they are very hard timber, so I won't really muck around too much with my lopping tool. I will just get myself access to the main leaders here with my second chair and then I'm gonna go straight for my pole saw. Let's go! You would be surprised how big of a then you can cut with secateurs if you apply a little trick. So for example this one, with this wood especially, it's very hard wood and it would be quite hard to cut this branch perpendicular to the branch. So the first trick you should use is to cut on an angle. It's much easier to cut on an angle than perpendicular. And then what you can also do is push. So you've got your blade here and see I would not be able to do it like this now. But you can also rotate. So one of the reasons why secateurs have these shapes is because you can actually sort of saw your, your way through there. So you start at the very end and then as you cut, you just push against the branch and it cuts it off. So that's, that helps me quite a lot. Then you don't have to use a, a, a bigger tool instantly for a, a larger branch. With the pole saw, I highly recommend you to wear a helmet, as I mentioned, and a visor if you have one with a, with a visor. If not, at least use safety glasses because there's a lot of sawdust coming down and some trees have sap that you might be allergic to. They irritate your eyes quite a bit. So just to avoid that. And now I'm trying to reduce weight on the top before I get into the center of the tree. I really want to cut this tree back to like there because this is the height that I can later on maintain with my loppers. And that means I have to cut the whole trail of the tree out. That's going to take a while, but this saw is quite quick. Uh, but you definitely want to start from the outside, so you don't have big limbs coming down on you, just for safety and also not to smash any of the plants around it.
see how fast that goes. So I've just destroyed a Davidson plum that's already grown quite a bit. It's not the end of the tree, but it's going to set it back a lot. So that was really unfortunate. I tried to not do that and it happened. So that's just a reminder of how quick it goes to damage the surrounding bits. Now you see what happened here. It's torn the bark on the back side here. So that's all buggered now. What I do is I'll try to get that down to the next leaf and there's still a leaf axle and it's going to reshoot from there. Now, see, you see how this branch is sort of crossing over this one? That's too busy in here. So we're going to get rid of that. All this here is way too busy. So I'm going to take that off here. And also while we're at it, now you, what you can see, see this here, this line? We call this the collar. And there's a bit of a, a line here, not much. Uh, there's a collar here, there's a collar there. So once you uh, you look a little bit closer on trees, you will find that, that all trees have that. And sometimes they also have a bit of a swelling. And you want to get to the collar, but sometimes the collar is a line like like this on a very steep angle. Now if you, I was to cut following this line, I would open a wound this long. So instead of doing this, I'm going to cut perpendicular to this branch here. Right, to reduce the wound surface, uh, you know, because the shortest surface I can create is the one that's perpendicular to the branch. But we're not cutting here. Well, I'll try to get, get rid of this entire uh, mess of branches here in the middle. And then we're going to do this with my pruning saw, not with the pole saw. And now it's time for this fella here. Very sharp saw. I really love that. This one is an overlength. It's very hard to get, you have to special order this one. Uh, they usually come, I think, about that much shorter. And I'm going to do a few trims on this branch here, on this uh, tree here now, to make sure that I'm not fraying too much and not tearing any bark to reduce the wound surface, and minimize the wound surface, I should say. I'll show you how. Now you see that these two branches here are quite close together and on a, on a weird angle it, it'll get too busy here so I'm gonna cut this one off and now have a look I'm gonna come in from this side and you see that these branches here look like they're still attached there but you will find as soon as I go a little bit further in there See, it's now almost loose, and now what I do is, I snap it off this side because now I know exactly where that branch stops and now I can be really precise to cut it to the very end and reduce the wound surface. Now the same thing over here as well, it doesn't matter too much here which side I start on but I want to keep a bit of an angle some people say if you cut straight then the water sits there longer so if I cut like horizontal here then the water could sit there so it's good to have a bit of an angle I'm gonna choose an angle like this and I'm gonna get rid of all that now this one is still a little bit long so I might just take that off first as you've seen before I've done what they call undercuts because especially this type of tree all the wattles that tear incredibly uh, long and so you wreck the tree by having long strips of bark torn out of it if you don't do these undercuts so you start you just cut on one side all it, it takes is just sever, sever the bark there and then you do the rest of the cut from the other side and I told you that this saw is really sharp so it doesn't really take a lot of cuts to do that it's a hot day today I'm sweating man. Wow. all right so I'm going to start from this side here and hopefully I'm going to meet over there. If I don't, if the saw runs off the track, I'm going to start on the other side to somehow meet in the middle. And as I mentioned before, you can also lift the branch here. See, it's almost loose. 
So if you just lift a bit, you reduce the friction on this one. Just be careful when you're done, you've got your arm here, you've got the saw here. So you want to be just really gentle now. So you're not cutting yourself. And off it comes. So when you come around, what you can see is, there's a little hump left here. On the corner. And that's not going to heal over very well. So I have to tidy this up. And I'm going to come in from the other side. And I tidy this up like that. And now the callus tissue can grow all over that. Then this cut here, can you see how it's not healed over? So I should have done that cut somewhere else. That's an old one. And while I'm here, oh, it's already, oh yeah, see what happened? It's already rotted and ants have made a house in there. So this is what I mentioned. If you don't do your cuts nicely, see how the, the collar has tried to heal over and there's lots of callus here, but it couldn't heal over that stump. And now that stump was exposed to the elements for a long time. I mean, what I could do is now is dig it out with my secateurs but the angle here is not very promising. Now, obviously, if you have to do that on like a hundred trees, it's going to be way too time consuming. So you might not make sure that you do your cuts nicely from the start. And in the end of the day, you're always going to have one cut that's not great, but the less you do, the better. Just overall, it's just a numbers game, really. Action. One last one here. And here we are. Okay guys, so now the next chapter is of course dealing with the green waste. Now when you have a look here, there's quite a lot of it. And I don't have a chipper yet. So chippers unfortunately are quite expensive, the good ones. And I definitely recommend you to buy something that can at least chip 70 to 100 millimeters. Uh, even a branch like this, if you have a chipper that only does 70 millimeters and you have this fork here, it's more than 70 millimeters, it's already got to struggle. It's going to struggle to get that through the shoot. So uh, get something bigger, but of course that will be more expensive. So my shout out today is I live in the Myola area of Coranda. And I would love to uh, jointly buy a chipper with other people. So if any one of you guys want to be part of something like a co-op uh, who share a chipper and invest uh, above the $10,000 mark for something that is also drivable on the road. So a roadworthy chipper that can be towed by a car. Nothing too heavy, so it's just something under two tons in weight. I'd love to chip in. Because chippers are one of those tools <clears throat> that you hardly ever use. Most of the year it's just parked in the shed anyway. So I would be really keen to instigate uh, communal, communal buys of tools that aren't used very often and that are quite expensive. And so a chipper would be one of those. Um, now, because we got no chipper right now, uh, I'll show you other techniques. But if you are keen to buy a chipper with me, just hit me up. Now, you will find contact in the comments of this video. And also, uh, you can always contact me as admin 
at mikegaia.com uh, and I'll show you now how to deal with all this green waste without a chipper. Now with these wattles here, the green branchlets are quite soft and easy to deal with. So once again, if you don't like me, let this wattle go crazy tall. You don't have to deal with large diameters too much. So ideally, the more often you prune your legume trees, the better, because it's just less labor intensive. And also you want the nitrogen. You don't want those big, chunky, woody pieces. You really want more leaves and skinny branches. Now I've got a machete and it's quite fast to do it with a machete. So if you watch me there, you just basically hack this thing into, into little pieces. Just watch your other hand doing that. I usually grab this whole branch in the back there. And then also in my stance, because I'm going to be working like this, I don't want to hack it to my knees. So I stand with my, with my legs far apart. So I can just chop like that and I'm unlikely to hit my legs as I'm doing that. Right, and then you just uh, basically go like that and it's really fast. And again, again, the smaller the branches, the faster it's going to go. Okay, and analog to that, you can also use your secateurs. So if you don't have a machete or if you're not daring to use it, and that's understandable. The secateurs, they're also almost as quick. So we've already done this area. There's a little pigeon pea coming up. I don't want to damage that. So I take a bit of grass out here. And there's my lemongrass. And so just to mulch this area here. I'm just gonna chop this all up with my secateurs. And then even for the bigger diameters, see, see that? You just go all the way around, eventually it'll cut it. Okay, so this is all I've got to show you today. I hope you enjoyed that. Once again, of course, I'd love you to uh, subscribe to my channel uh, so you get updated about future workshop that, workshops that I will be holding. Uh, that is also an, a little hint that there will be a workshop soon. And watch this space, I'll announce it soon, but also for future videos. I'll try to put up more instructional videos like the one today if I find the time and uh, until then happy gardening and enjoy your growing food forest.